verse number 7. Even from the days your fathers, you are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Well, the man robbed God, yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you, the, open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He shall not devour the fruits of your ground, neither shall the vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Continuing our study, I think we've got one or two more lessons, sermons, whatever, on uh, on the post-captivity books. We're here in the book of Malachi, it's the last book of the Old Testament, uh, and it uh, some say John the Baptist walked out of this book and walked right onto the pages of the New Testament. Of course, we know there was a 400-year gap in between there. But, uh, but nonetheless, the last book of the Bible, uh, of the Old Testament, and this prophet is writing to the remnant that has come back, uh, the remnant of Judah that has come back to Jerusalem, and they've rebuilt the temple, and they've rebuilt the wall, and, uh, and they have uh, they've become lackadaisical in their work, they've become apathetic and lazy, and uh, this prophet of God is dealing with sin. He started with the priests, then he moves on to the people beyond just the Levitical priesthood, and uh, he deals with divorce in this book, he deals with immorality in this book, he deals with outward religion and, and dead, dry religion in this book. And uh, all of the sins that he, he's uh, talked about were directed toward these remnant. How many of you know that God doesn't just deal with the sins of the world, but he deals with the sins of his people in his church? And, uh, and so, uh, verse number 7 exposes, I believe, the state of their heart. He gives them a great invitation. He said, he said return unto me, and I will return unto you. Uh, but then, but then there is a refusal here at the end of verse number seven to even admit that they had ever left him in the first place. It says, "Return unto me; I will return unto you," said the Lord of hosts. But ye said, "Wherein shall we return?" Well, we didn't do anything wrong. Uh, we haven't done anything against the word of the Lord, and so we see the state of their heart. In verse number 8, the Lord gets real serious with them, this, the people of God, and He says, Ye have robbed me. You've robbed me. Now, this message was specific to Israel in that day. He said, they said, where have we robbed you? He said, in tithes and offerings. Now, that's a specific message to Israel in that day. Uh, it could be a message that needs to be applied in some churches today. I didn't come to shear the sheep about tithing tonight or this afternoon. That's not my intent. However, if there's some individual in our church that needs to hear the message, I tell you this, if you're holding back on God with your finances, you're robbing God. And, uh, and, and it's a dangerous situation to be in. But that's not the message I... I, 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 the application I feel like as a pastor that we need in this church, but I believe there's a broader application here. He talks about those tithes, but then there's this part about the offerings. Uh, the tithes and the offerings. Now I'm not going to talk to you tonight about tithing, but that offering part. You look that up in Strong's and uh, it's, it, it says that it means a heave offering. That was a Jewish offering, Old Testament offering, 
where they would take a part of the animal and ceremonially they would heave it up to God as if to say, we're offering what we have to you. And there's a broader application here than just our money. Uh, but we're talking about the offerings of our time. We're talking about the offerings of our sacrifices and what we're willing to do for the Lord. We're talking about the offerings of our labors, the works of our hands, the offering up of our thanksgiving and our praise toward God. Statistically speaking, I saw this statistic the other day, in the average church in America, 35% of the congregation does all of the financial giving. And, uh, and I'm, not, I'm not here to preach about finances. I just thought that might interest you. 35% of the church is doing all of the financial giving. Well, I don't know what it is in our church, and it don't matter. But it did leave me, it did stir my mind. I wonder what percentage of the church in America today is doing all of the rest of the work. The preaching, the praying, the singing, uh, and, and then outside the walls of this church, the time, the sacrifices, the works of the Lord. I mean, we're all in this building project together, aren't we? Somebody help me. I wonder what the percentage is. Uh, the Lord, I believe, is trying to help Israel see Judah, the, this remnant. I believe He's trying to help them see the value of being all in for God, as we say. He's trying to teach them, hey, you know, you can't have a foot, a one foot in the world and one foot in heaven. You can't, you can't live in two different worlds. You need to be all in for the Lord. I heard a story about a little boy. His mom and dad bought him and his brother some bunk beds and put the bunk beds in their room and the, the, one of the boys picked out that top bunk and said, okay, that's going to be yours. And so this was back in the day when they didn't have any safety bars on the bunk beds. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Homemade, two before some plywood. And uh, they put that little boy up in there and, and he rolled out. First night he rolled out, hit the floor. They ran in there. Uh, are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. They put him back in the bed. Well, this happened every night. He would roll out of the bed. Every night, like clockwork, they would hear the thud. He would roll out in the bed. They'd rush in there and make sure he was okay. And he, 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 the man told his little boy, he said, we're going to have to figure out something. He said, you keep rolling out of bed like this, you're going to get hurt eventually. And We've got to figure something out. And it wasn't too long that the little boy went to bed, climbed up in his top bunk, and the man woke up the next morning and realized he had slept all night long and he never heard his little boy fall out of bed. And he ran in there to make sure he was okay and the little boy was still up there in his bed. He, they began to celebrate and he said, I'm, I'm proud of you. He, he stayed in your bed all night long. He said, son, what did you do different tonight that you haven't done all of the rest of the nights? And he said, well, can't really think of anything. He said, all I know to say is, is when I decided to crawl up into bed, he said, I got as far in there as I could and decided that the reason I was rolling out all the time was because I was sleeping right there on the edge. Well, that's the way it is for our Christianity. That's the way it is for our service of the Lord. Uh, we either need to get all in uh, or, or uh, we, we need to be all in for God. The reason we roll out so much, I'm not talking about losing our salvation, but I'm talking about the reason we're in and out of the work of the Lord is because we stay too close to the edge. But verse number 9, there's a statement that's made about this remnant. Very serious. God says ye are cursed with a curse. What is a curse on a local church? What does a, church on, a curse on a church, New Testament church look like? Is it bad numbers? You know, well, it could be. Not, not, not very many people attending. Services ill attended. Not very many people getting saved. Not very many people getting baptized. You know, maybe the numbers is what a curse looks like. Or maybe it's uh, financial figures. A curse on the church might, uh, might reveal itself or manifest itself in financial difficulty 
But I want you to listen to me real close. I believe occurs on the on the local church today could could look like this. It could be a full house full of people and a full bank account full of money and hearts just as cold as ice toward God. Empty services, empty worship, empty praise. Uh, no power of the Holy Ghost, no moving of the Holy Spirit. You've been cursed with a curse, but there's a, there, we also find in this statement that's made there, verse number 9, uh, that it involves not only Judah, but it involves a whole nation. It says, you, have, you are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Uh, I take that to mean that God is saying, not only are you cursed with a curse, but this whole nation is cursed with a curse. What does a curse on a nation look like that has robbed God? Well, you could talk about our economy. Maybe it shows up in America's finances. I don't know. But I'll say this. I think it could be, it could look like a perfectly wealthy nation that is full of immorality and disdain for the things of God. Our nation is cursed. We're living under the curse of sin. You know what the answer, the antidote for that is? Go back up to verse number 7. Return unto me and I will return unto you. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Return. Verse number 10 the Lord sets forth a great opportunity for the people of God. He says, he says, uh, he says, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse. Bring your offerings, that is. The broader application, bring your, bring, bring your life. What you have, what you can do, your abilities, your talents, whatever it is, bring it to the Lord. And I love this part, and prove me here with you. To prove, it means to test. I'm reminded of that psalm where the psalmist said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Bring what you have to me and what you are to me and test me. Give me your whole life. See what happens. If you're tired of the curse, if you're tired of being downtrodden, are you tired of being unhappy and feel like God is a million miles away? Then here is the solution. You bring me your offerings, the Lord says. Whether that's finances, time, sacrifices, praise and thanksgiving, whatever your offerings are, you bring me yourself and you test me with it. Prove me with it. Verse number 10, the Lord says there'll be a blessing. He says, bring all the tithes to the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now here with, saith the Lord of hosts, listen to this, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that shall not be room enough to receive. God's test of giving Results in a blessing. We see the source of the blessing. He said, I'll open up the windows of heaven. It's going to be a heavenly blessing that he's promising. That's important for us to see because uh, the source of the blessing determines what kind of a blessing it is. It's a heavenly blessing. And, uh, and the word blessing means prosperity. But I want you to understand something. In a day when the prosperity gospel, as they call it, is being preached falsely all over this world, we need to understand that prosperity looks different from heaven's view than it does from the world's view. God sees a beggar that is rich in faith and hope and love and mercy and labor and joy where the world just sees a beggar. And God doesn't measure our worth by or our success by money as does the world. 
It's not a worldly prosperity gospel. But friends, it most certainly is a prosperity gospel when we're talking about God opening up the windows of heaven. The source, the delivery, he said, I will pour out the blessing upon you. He didn't say he was going to hand it out to us. He didn't say, here's a good Texas word, he didn't say, I'm going to daub a little bit on you. But he said, I'm going to pour it out. You see, handing out or daubing on, those are terms of application that indicate the ease of of pain and the Lord does ease our pain and the Lord does give us temporary relief from time to time and that's not the kind of blessing that he's talking about uh, he said I will pour out my blessing uh, this application indicates uh, uh, that the people or a person or people of God are, are basking in the joys of the Lord we're talking about showers of blessing a pouring out uh, not just temporary relief, but victory. We're talking about not just enduring the hardships, but enjoying the Lord. I'm going to pour out the blessing, the abundance of the blessing. He said, I'll pour out more that there, will, there shall not be room enough to receive it. I can't help but wonder how much of God's goodness we miss because of our own people. Well, preacher, that's hard talk. That's what God says. He said, you robbed God. Robbed the God of your tithes and your offering. We hold back of ourselves and God holds back of Himself. We want, here's the problem right here. We want to know what the payoff is before we offer anything. The reality of it is, whether you think it's a good investment plan or not with God, He simply don't tell us what the payoff's going to be. He just said, I'll open up the windows of heaven and give you more than what you know to do with, but, but, but I'm not going to tell you exactly what that's going to be. I'm not going to tell you exactly what that's <coughs> going to look like. And so we, we look at this, and, and the fear of the unknown uh, doesn't set well with us in our in our human and finite mind. And so the reality of it is God doesn't tell us what the payoff's going to be so we don't take the risk. But the whole while, there's this, there's this itch in the back of our mind where we know that God said, I'm not going to tell you what, exactly what you've got coming as far as blessing. But it'll be more than you have room for. You see, it's a trust issue. Uh, we're either going to trust God that He's, that he's going to bless us when we do what He wants us to do, or we're not. In verse number 11, for, uh, for them bringing an offering of God, of themselves to God, He offers them protection in return. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. He offers them protection, divine protection against the devourer. Now, uh, in context, this devourer is probably talking about the locusts. They were probably having some kind of an infestation of locusts or of grasshoppers, what we would call it, in Texas. They were going through there and they were devouring. Have you ever seen a grasshopper devour a coastal hayfield? I mean, they, they did every, anything that's green, it's gone. Uh, it, they, they just devour it. And, uh, and, he was going, he was offering that he was going to protect them in a physical kind of a way from this bug or whatever it is that was devouring their crops. But can I get you to agree with me this afternoon? Sometimes the devourer is more mental and spiritual than he is physical. We need protection from depression, don't we? We need protection from apathy. This is becoming lazy on God. Uh, we need protection from anger. There's a good one. 
Did you know that anger will devour you if it festers? The adversary, uh, by application I mean, the adversary is devouring today. He's devouring homes, he's devouring churches, he's devouring relationships with people, friends. All of the while, we hold back on God. He said, not only will I protect you from the devourer, but you'll have unhindered fruitfulness. Your, 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 uh, your, your fields, your, the fruit of your ground, you'll be fruitful, the vine, uh, the ground and the vine. Fruitful. Uh, our efforts, when we hold out on God and we uh, retain part of ourselves for ourselves, our efforts seem unfruitful and our labors go in vain while we hold out on God. Not only that, but he said, I'll protect you in this way from the timing being off. He said, he said, the vine will not cast forth its fruit before its time. Uh, in order to be fruitful in our work and in our labors for the Lord, we need to have good timing. Did you know there's just the right time to witness to somebody? There's just the right time to give benevolence to people uh, or our money to mission works. I mean, obviously, we can't meet every need that every missionary has. There's timing in this thing. It's divine timing. And we miss opportunities uh, we, we're, 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 uh, we're, our hearing is slow and our speech is swift a lot of times. We're, the timing is off. We don't accomplish our mission a lot of times because of bad timing while we're holding out of God. Verse number 12, he says, if you won't do that, if you'll, if you'll bring what you are and what you have to me, and offer it to me. Give it up to me. Verse number 12. I'll give you favor. And all the nations shall call you blessed. For ye shall be a delightsome land. Saith the Lord of hosts. What he meant by this was. Is that they would be able to get the attention of the world. Now we're not talking about vain glory attention. But we're just saying that the Lord, that the Lord would would make them to be to where they were a light shining on a hill, as it were. Uh, and and I, I want to say this about our church. Highland should not be a secret in Erath County or in Comanche County or the surrounding areas, Eastland County. Uh, God, if we'll give Him what we have, He will... He will draw attention towards this place in a good kind of a way and in a godly kind of a way. And He has done that in the past. I hope we realize that God has given us favor here at Highland. The, the guy, that, the, the, the man that came and sang last Sunday talked about how he said, I've never seen a church like this one. That's favor. That's favor that God has given us. There's no telling how many people we've talked to over the years that, that, have, that are not members of our church, but they may be friends or acquaintances of our church, and they say, I've never known a church like I have. We get uh, attention, and I, I hate to even say it like that because it makes it sound like we're getting it for us, but that's not what I mean. God has given us favor here in this place. Uh, it ought not be wasted. Uh, we ought to be able to use our whatever favor God gives us to reach the lost in our communities. And to let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify God which is in heaven. But also it tells us here that they would be viewed as a delightsome land. The church, by application, will be viewed as a delightful place. We'll give what we have to God and let Him use it. People will understand just how valuable, just how valuable 
a church in a community like ours really is. Some people will come and they will not stay, and that's fine, and we understand that. But we find often, those of us that have ever left and maybe came back or left Highland for a time, we find often you can't find what we have here out there. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist anywhere, I'm just saying that it don't come around too often. God gives us favor. Now we know what it is to work and to, and to be blessed by God. We've seen that played out here over the years. For many years, we, we know what that is. But we can't help but wonder sometimes if we're actually living in the fullness of God. Is the blessing that we realize today, is that just the Lord daubing a little bit on us, trying to make it another year, another week, another mile, uh, or is he handing us just a little bit here and there? But, but, but listen, wouldn't it be wonderful to experience a pouring out, a pouring out of God's blessing so much that we wouldn't have room to receive it. We can put God to the test with what we bring to the table. He said, you bring what you have. You bring of yourself and your offering and prove me therewith. Uh, test God. He can take our people efforts and uh, that are offered in faith and He can pour it on us that there shall not be room enough to receive His blessings. Amen. We've known it before. We can know it again by the, by the truth of the Word of God. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be in your house today, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you, to be a member of this church, and to serve you uh, in our communities, Lord, and point the lost to, uh, to Jesus Christ, the only hope of salvation. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities you give us to do that. Lord, we just ask a special blessing on each one that's been here in your house today, each family that's been represented. We ask that you be with the sick. And, uh, and those that need uh, need help and a touch of God in some way. Lord, we ask you to touch our church. ask you to put, put your hand upon our nation. Uh, Lord, do what needs to be done. That we might, our attention might be directed towards you, Lord, and our hearts might be turned to thee. Lord, we just pray that you would uh, bless this week. Bring us safely again in your house. In Jesus' name we pray.